We have an amazing next speaker. Her name is Dr. Christina Radsai. She's a veterinary medical officer in Pennsylvania, and she's with USDA APHIS Animal Care. Thank you, Christina. Hello, so today we'll be talking about daily observations, what they are, uh, why they're necessary, and how they improve animal welfare. And I'll primarily be focusing on small pets, since that's kind of our focus for this uh, meeting. So guinea pigs, hamsters, and rabbits, especially in those group house facilities, so breeders and brokers. And we'll focus on some of the particular challenges of doing daily observations of small pets that can make it just a little bit more difficult to detect health problems in these species. So some of the topics we'll be covering, regulatory requirements, definition of daily observations, some best practices, some tools that you might want to have at your disposal to use to make more effective daily observations, design of facilities in order to improve your ability to do it, daily observations, things in the environment that you want to look for when you're doing observations, also physical appearance and behavior of the animals, and some common veterinary care issues. So the regulation is found in the blue book. You see a picture of that on this slide. That's the Animal Welfare Act that contains all of our regulations that licensees are required to follow. Uh, the regulation is 2.40 B3, that's the veterinary care section. And it states that each dealer or exhibitor shall establish and maintain programs of adequate veterinary care that include daily observation of all animals to assess their health and well being. The second part of the regulation that is pertinent is that the programs of vet care also must include the use of appropriate methods to treat diseases and injuries. So it's not just enough for licensees to be observing animals. They also have to be treating any diseases or injuries that they observe. Definition of daily observation, it's simply to observe all animals on a daily basis for signs of illness, injury, or abnormal behavior. Most cases, it is done by licensees, but you have to have a means to communicate what your findings are with the attending veterinarian. So if you are seeing signs of illness or injury, contacting your vet and seeing how they want you to treat, treat that. Some of the benefits of daily observations, early detection of illnesses and injuries results in less expense and better welfare. So the more a disease or illness progresses, it's going to be harder to treat and it's probably also going to be more expensive. So the earlier that you can pick up on some kind of issue with the animal, kind of the better off you are as far as for the animal's welfare and also for how much it's going to cost. Also, when health problems are observed or treated, they're less likely to result in non-compliances documented on the inspection report. Um, we don't expect you not to have, we don't expect licensees not to have sick animals. We just require that you are observing all animals for signs of illness and addressing those uh, diseases or illnesses that you see with some type of treatment. So some best practices uh, for doing daily observations. And as Bob stated in his presentation earlier, when you have small pets like this, they are prey animals. So they are gonna hide signs of disease probably until it's too late. So it's gonna be a little bit more of a challenge to do daily observations in these animals. You know, they, they will just kind of hide those signs of disease and you may just find like a dead animal if you're not really looking closely. The other thing is they're smaller. So of course, a smaller animal, their eyes are smaller, their feet are smaller. It'll be a lot harder to kind of see what those physical issues are. So some tips for conducting daily observations. You want to conduct them separate from other tasks, such as feeding or cleaning. 
that will really allow you to focus on looking at the animal instead of whatever task you're doing. You want to carefully observe each animal in a systematic way. So it doesn't really matter what your system is, if you want to start at the head and go to the feet, if you want to kind of do each body system, just so you have some kind of way that you're doing it the same every time so you're not missing anything. Finally, and these are just best practices, they're tips, they're not requirements. We don't require documenting what you observe, but it is helpful to have like a notebook or some way that you're documenting what you see. So as you're going around, if you see like an animal that has an eye issue, that and we don't usually we don't require individual identification for these small pet species. So just, you know, if you're writing down kind of a description of the animal, like brown and white guinea pig, and 1031, eye infection, and the date, you know, then you know, you know, which animal it is, so you can follow up on it, you know, contact your vet, document when you started treatment, so you know when to end treatment, that can really help. So we'll talk a little bit about some tools that you might use when doing daily observations. It's important to have proper lighting so you can actually see the animal. So this is a picture I took on an inspection and I wasn't really trying to take a picture of the animal, but it's the lighting is, is so difficult that you can barely see that there's an animal in that enclosure. It's hard to tell what the animal is. It's actually a rabbit. So as you're doing your daily observations, if your facility does not have great lighting like this one, you definitely wanna have some light source like a flashlight so you can shine into those enclosures and actually see the animal. It's important to have a step stool or a ladder if you have stacked pens in your facility, which is pretty common in these small pet facilities. So here's an example on the picture of stacked pens in a rabbit facility. Um, they're stacked three high. So there's a rolling step stool there, especially important for someone like me who's short, who, you know, to see the animal in the top enclosure, who may, may need some assistance with that. Having a thermometer is also important. Um, we have specific requirements for temperature. Um, for example, guinea pigs have to be kept between 60 and 85 degrees, and ideal temperature probably for guinea pigs is 65 to 75, so you can see this picture was at a facility, a breeder, that had the guinea pigs being kept at around 48 degrees, so that's definitely too cold, and so you, you know, as you're doing your observations, you want to look at temperature because that's really going to have an effect on you know, the health and wellness of the animals. Having gloves as you're doing this is helpful as well. If you're handling animals from one pen that might have infections and then you go to the next pen, definitely want to change gloves. Also important because ringworm is pretty common in these facilities. Um, ringworm is zoonotic, so that can be passed from animals to people. So definitely if you're handling animals with ringworm, you want to protect yourself by wearing gloves. Program of veterinary care um, that is required for to be written for facilities that have a part-time attending vet, which is pretty common in our breeding facilities. They don't have a vet that's full-time. So to have a program of written, a written program of veterinary care. Um, especially helpful if it kind of spells out how to treat some of these common conditions and so licensees don't have to contact the vet every time. But, you know, not necessarily carrying it with you as you're doing your observations, but having that available, knowing where that is in case you do see an animal that has an illness, you know, if it's spelled out how to treat that, if there's specific instructions from your vet in the program of vet care, having that as a reference is very useful. So we'll talk a little bit about facility planning and the things that might affect how effective you're able to do your daily observations and how difficult or easy they are based on the way your facility is laid out. 
So the layout of the pens and cages in a way that offers the best visualization of the animals and also airflow. Um, airflow will, will affect how many sick animals you have. If you don't have good airflow, if you have a buildup of ammonia odors, that's going to have result in increased numbers of sick animals. So we'll look at some common facility designs here. Um, pretty common to see in these small pet breeding facilities, stacked pens where you have a large number of animals being concentrated in a small area. So very effective use of space, but can lead some to some challenges in both observing the animals and the health of the animals. So the picture on the left as a guinea pig facility, again, very common of what we see is pens, aluminum, stainless steel type pens that are stacked five high. Um, so problems with this would be airflow. A lot of these breeding facilities do not have HVAC systems. A lot of times it's just an open window to provide airflow, and especially in the winter when those windows are closed, when you get that much, um, you know, animals concentrated in such a small area, you can really have problems with ammonia odors, and that's going to lead to more sick animals that you're going to have to look for on your daily observations. It's also going to be more challenging because you can see those pens on the left just have a little sliver of space that you can look in and see those guinea pigs. So it's going to be a lot harder to actually observe the, for signs of illness in, in that kind of uh, setup. The picture in the middle is similar. That's also a guinea pig breeding facility, but even more challenging because there really isn't an open space to look in. The, the door covers the whole front. I mean, there's a wire, uh, you know, front that you can look in, but also the water bottles are hung on, so it's also obstructing the view. So that's going to be a really challenging facility to do daily observations and to see those animals. Picture on the right, that's a hamster facility. Again, pretty common layout for what we see. It's kind of stacks of pens where you have to pull out the enclosure to look and to actually see the animal. And in this case, there's a uh, note card that's um, even further blocking your view uh, as you um, on the front of the enclosures. So again, looking a little closer at common hamster cages, they are commonly these um, kind of enclosures with um, that you have to kind of pull out and look in. And even when you do that, you can see that on the left, the top of the enclosure commonly is used to hold the water bottle and the food. So it's still difficult to see, actually see the animals in that enclosure until you take off that lid. And then the picture on the right, you can see what the hamsters actually look like. Especially for like dwarf hamsters, especially if there's a lot that are kind of burrowed down in the bedding, you really may have to actually like dig through the bedding to visualize each of those animals. Here's a better example of uh, facility layout. These are elevated pens. So you can see the airflow situation is much better. There's airflow above and below the pens. There's not as many animals concentrated in that area. And also, you can see those animals much easier than those stacked pens. Here are some more floor pens. These are for rabbits. Again, just much easier to visualize the animals, much better for airflow. These are outdoor cages, and these are rabbit cages. So hamsters, we don't allow to be housed outdoors. Guinea pigs can only be housed outdoors with uh, our approval of the administrator. Rabbits are able to be housed outdoors, um, but, and it's a little hard to see with the formatting of this picture, but if they are housed outdoors, you do have to have some type of shelter. That's what is lacking in this picture. So they're just kind of open. But the cages stacked up, you would have to have some shelter from sunlight and from the weather elements, rain and snow and things like that. So lighting, again, is also important in planning your facility so you can visualize all the animals. Heating and cooling is just going to be important, again, 
if you don't have the proper temperatures in the facility, you're going to have more health problems in the animals. So having a good system of heating and cooling is going to help with your um, with doing your observations because you're not going to have as many sick animals impervious surfaces so that would be surfaces that do not absorb moisture um so bare wood that is not painted or sealed is not impervious so that's gonna absorb moisture it's gonna trap bacteria especially ringworm um so that's gonna cause more problems more illnesses um that you're gonna have to be observing for Sanitization schedule is also important as far as the health and welfare of the animals. A lot of our breeding facilities are cleaning once a week. That may not be adequate in some cases. The more soiled the enclosure is, if you have a buildup of you know, soil bedding, that's gonna create ammonia odors. It could also be damp, it could trap bacteria. So you just, the less you clean, the more likely you're gonna have more illnesses that you're gonna have to be observing and treating. So when you do your daily observations, you wanna look at the environment of the animal. So again, looking at temperature, um, making sure that the appropriate temperatures are in the facility um, for the health and welfare of the animals. Airflow, again, buildup of ammonia odors is going to have a negative impact. It will cause discomfort, we see in increased respiratory infections, so a lot more illnesses in the animals if you don't have adequate airflow. Compatibility, um, so in these group house facilities, you will see animals fighting, and so you do have to monitor for that if animals are not getting along, ensuring that you have um, the correct grouping of animals, so multiple males could be fighting. And then also overcrowding. So the more animals in a smaller space, you're gonna have increased fighting. So less animals in the enclosure, probably gonna have less fighting. Also, you're gonna, you know, not have as many sanitation issues and airflow issues as well. So keeping the animals spread out will definitely help with their health and welfare. So you're gonna to wanna to look at the physical appearance of the animals. So again, kind of systematically going through hair coat. So you're gonna to wanna to look for loss of hair. Um, also like a dull hair coat could be indications of illness, body condition, primarily animals that are too thin. So if you see kind of a hollowed out appearance, um, prominent ribs or spine, that could be an indication that they're is something underlying going on? Skin, looking for injuries, seeing if the animals are scratching. Do you see red skin? Do you see scabs? Animals that are limping or holding a foot up, swollen joints. And then eyes, ears, and nose, looking for discharge, squinting eyes. Those are all signs of disease that you want to look for in treat. So I also want to look at behavior. So looking to see, are the animals bright, alert, reactive? Are they active? Are they moving around? Or are they just kind of sitting in one place? Are they in a the corner? Are they not moving around? Do they look lethargic? Huddling and shivering is not something that you see too commonly as far as if it's cold, I would say, again, these are prey animals, they show more subtle signs of uh, being cold and this picture here was the guinea pig facility that I showed earlier that was 48 degrees and really this is the only indication that these animals were cold is what I can see is they are concentrated in those sunlight beams. Um, and I think, you know, basically to, you know, absorb that warmth because it was so cold in there. Um, if it's too hot, you can see them splayed out and panting. So just kind of stretched out. Um, definitely want to look to see are they eating? Are they drinking? Do you see any vomiting, any diarrhea? So uh, 
our last topic here that we're going to talk about are some common vet care issues that we see in these facilities. So we'll talk about wounds, ringworm, lameness, lumps, eye infection, diarrhea, and respiratory infection. So here are some examples of wounds. We do see this somewhat commonly. Again, you have a large number of animals housed in a group. You're going to have animals that are fighting with each other. So the top two pictures are what I see fairly commonly um, as far as the pattern in guinea pigs. I see this kind of butterfly-shaped area over the back toward the rear where for whatever reason that's kind of where they tend to pick on so you can see hair loss red skin abraded skin bleeding scabs you can see the bottom right picture that wound is actively bleeding and then the bottom left picture there we see this commonly those ear bite injuries again that's kind of a common sign that the animals are fighting with each other so just uh, keep keep an eye out for all of those things. Ringworm is very common in, the, in these facilities. It's kind of, it's not a worm, it's a fungus, but because of that circular area of hair loss, it's where it's, it's got its name. So here's pictures of ringworm and two guinea pigs on the left. We commonly see it on the face, so that's what you can see in that picture. But you can see it anywhere on the body, which you see on the right. It's kind of over the hip area in that guinea pig. And you can basically see um, hair loss, redness, and scabs, which is more what the picture on the left looks like. Or you could just see kind of flaky, crusty skin, which is the picture on the right there. I have a little video here of a guinea pig that I saw in one of my inspections that we'll take a look at. So as you can see, this is an example of an animal that's having difficulty walking. It looks like pretty much completely paralyzed in the back end. And this is a weanling, but I see this commonly in adult females after they give birth for some reason, um, tend to have this uh, weakness or paralysis in the back end. So. Again, something we want our licensees to keep an eye out for, um, especially if it's advanced, it, it can be something that's kind of difficult to treat. Um, but we, we can also see other signs that may cause lameness, and that's what we see on this slide here. So this is uh, commonly called bumblefoot, but it's protodermatitis, and it's you'll see it as a swelling of the feet, could be the front or the back feet. It's commonly on red skin. You could have abrasions in the skin. Um, it's very painful. So you will see the animals limping or they might be holding a foot up. Sometimes difficult to see because, you know, they kind of have their feet down in the bedding. So you really have to look pretty closely for this because the bedding, you know, can kind of just cover their feet and can make it difficult to see these swellings. But you do commonly see that they're kind of reluctant to move or maybe holding a foot up and then you want to take a closer look. It, it's really difficult to treat. So something that you want to catch pretty early um, can improve chances of being able to treat this. Um, and again, as a lot of these issues are, sanitation plays a big part in this. If you have Inadequate cleaning, soiled bedding, that's really gonna cause those abrasions in the feet where the bacteria can enter and that's what causes these infections. So these are commonly called lumps, but it's basically an infection of that submandibular lymph node in a guinea pig. Um, see these somewhat commonly in our breeding facilities as well. Um, it's, you know, basically an abscess in that lymph node, um, commonly treated by antibiotics, but you may have to lance and drain that abscess. Usually doesn't 
affect the animal systemically. They're usually still eating and drinking, but important to have that treated. It can get large enough to rupture. It also can get large enough to cause them not to be eating or drinking. Um, again, I think sanitation probably plays a role in this as well, as far as uh, bacteria that get in there and cause an infection. So eye infections are also pretty common in these facilities. Uh, picture on the left is a guinea pig, picture on the right is a rabbit, both with eye infections. So you can see squinting, you can see discharge in the eyes, um, redness in the eyes, hair loss around the eyes. Um, so again, they're prey species. So you do sometimes have to look close because they will a lot of times keep that bad eye turned away from you. Um, so these can sometimes be difficult to find. Diarrhea, we see this in a rabbit on the left and a hamster on the right here. So you can either see it coating the back end of the animal or um, in the enclosure. Um, again, can sometimes be difficult um, because it's kind of on the underside of the animal. So you may have to look pretty close. You may just see an animal that's lethargic and you want to take a closer look and then see what problems you find. And then respiratory infections, those we also see sometimes as well. So in this case, you can see a rabbit on the left, guinea pig on the right, uh, nasal discharge, discharge from the eyes. Sometimes you can see open mouth breathing or labored breathing and increased respiratory rate or effort. Those are definitely things you want to keep an eye out for and treat if you find. So that concludes my presentation today. This is my contact information if you have any questions later on, but I think we have a few minutes. We can take some questions now if there are any. I'm not showing any questions right now, Christina. If you have a question, please put it in the question box. We'll answer it. Can you expound on the pathogenesis of the guinea pig that could not walk? Um, I don't really know what the reason was for that. It was a young guinea pig, so I don't, it could have been born that way, could have been an infection. Um, uh, you know, I don't treat the animals, so sometimes I don't really find out what causes the problems. I, like I said, the most common cases I see are females after giving birth, and I assume that's some kind of nerve damage as they're giving birth, um, but probably an attending vet would have more information on that than I would. Okay, thank you. Uh, is lumps like lumpy jaw, are they the same cause? Um, they can be caused like different bacteria, so it, it, they've isolated a, a variety of bacteria in, in these abscesses, but it, it's, it's similar in that it's, you know, an infection in there, um, you know, that, that causes swelling and, and, you know, abscesses and things like that, um, but it can be a variety of bacteria that cause the infection in guinea pigs. Okay, thank you. Not showing any more questions. 